Fire Radio. Hey everybody, Jeremy, National Fire Radio. Welcome back to the pod podcast. Jeez, I'm fumbling over my words already. I've taken like two weeks off, so here we are. I'm a little rusty. Raymond Dorval, welcome, brother. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate this platform, brother. Come on. Are you kidding me? This is um this has been a long t- you know, a long time coming. Um in, in a lot of different ways. We connected on Instagram a ways back. Uh your Instagram handle, the way of the nozzle. Um great motivational training, uh leadership, mentorship, a lot of great things that you do with your Instagram channel. Um and I love following it and being a part of it and watching what you're doing. Um, but that comes on the backbone of a lot of incredible hard work that you've put in. Uh, I want to talk about real quick our first meet, our one and only time we've met outside of today. Uh, we met in person up in uh, New Hampshire of yeah, all absolutely. places. Yeah, you're you're out of Miami Dade, right? You're a, you're a lieutenant down in Miami Dade. Uh, but I met you at the New Hampshire Fire Academy where you were tasked with motivating six or fourteen to eighteen year old kids. Yeah, at their at their junior academy that they run at the very uh, yeah, very different. What an unbelievable yeah. program! We'll start with that, right? Absolutely, absolutely, a different experience for me. From um, I've spoken to kids on certain levels, mm. but to interact with kids in that fashion and try to give them, uh, you know, a motivational speech in a format that I normally give to adults, but you know, I kind of you know not dumbed it down, but made it more so that it's not too intimidating for them, you know. And to see see how many of them grasped it and actually came out and asked me questions was kind of crazy. So I mean, because um, you, you know, know how to connect. Yeah, it's I you know I, I I'm, I'm blessed with a gift. Uh, you know, my mother always told me that I was blessed with that gift, just to go ahead and just preach or try to give my message. And that's something that I, I look forward to doing. So I mean, being able to engage with the youth, the future is a big deal to me. You know, just like my sons and um, those kids. You know, Mike gave me a great platform to try to speak to them. And coming all the way up to New Hampshire, never been there. <laughs> all you wanted to do was see a bear, right? Is that right? Oh, yeah, I think yeah, it was, yeah, You wanted to yeah, see a bear, yeah. right? You wanted to see a bear, man. Well, you know what was fun was uh, I had my daughter Lily with me when we stopped up that day. I had ended up speaking uh, that next morning, I think it was, or whatever. Yeah. And um, and so I, I was honored to be bestowed the opportunity to speak to the young kids, too, and we have such an obligation and duty to do that. And so, you know, anytime I have the opportunity to speak with kids, man, you got to set the tone, but you got to treat them with uh, just underlying respect across the board, treat them as an equal and talk to them like they're real. I think we sugarcoat so much stuff in life today. We, we take away any, uh, any adversity that they might, uh, possibly have to deal with because we're tra- always trying to make it easier for the younger kids. But all they want to do is be talked to and treated like an equal. Facts, facts, man. I could, I could tell you from a lot of life lessons for myself. Mm. Like you know, growing up, I was rather um, poor, and I would hate to say unfortunate because I still felt fortunate. Yeah. But like just like you or my uh, yourself and me, you know, we surround our kids with just amazing things. Yes. Amazing opportunities. Um, I know it seems small, but like lights, AC, a roof. So all these things that we've given to them, they have never been presented with. Uh, uh, like uh, they have never had something that they were wanting for. So when they go out, they go out there and reality kind of hits. And they were not ready for that because they've never been in a situation where they were at the bottom. So, you know, if we could speak to them just like you're talking about, just to give them the reality, the real and not try to sugarcoat things. I, I actually live on that and try to portray my message as best I could. So that way, I actually did that in New Hampshire to make sure they understood that this is who I am, you know, if I could reflect on you like that. so I love it. I, there's so much to that. And in fact, I actually did it this morning with myself. I took a moment. I, I worked out this morning. I started, I started getting good again about taking care of myself for a yeah. long time. I just didn't, you know, uh, the hustle and bustle of life and work and all these things. You know, I never put my uh, physical fitness uh, at the forefront, and I have the last few weeks now, walking every morning, back in the gym three days a week. Like, I'm starting to get back into it again and starting right. to enjoy it, which is long overdue. Yeah. Um, and I always feel better with it. When I was done, I sat down on my patio, 
uh, and uh, had a cup of coffee, and it was quiet. It's a beautiful morning. We had sweatshirts on this morning. It was like 55 degrees out. Uh-huh. And, and, bro, let me tell you, I sat there, and it was quiet, and I just took some time to reflect, which I haven't done in a very, very long time. Um, and a lot of that reflection was how grateful I am for what I have. And when you talk about just simple, not even simple things, but for us, things that we've come to uh, come to expect, a roof over our heads, food, yeah. to feed, you know, food to eat, just simple things. And I've come to really, um, I don't know, grasp that a little bit more and understanding how grateful we truly are. And then I and then I go down the road of thinking about a lot of my friends and the friendships I've made and the true friends that I keep in my inner circle and how grateful I am for that, especially with September 11th this week, you know, uh, this Wednesday, um, you know, for us, it, uh, this whole weekend was a reflection upon September 11th and, and the friends that we lost and all of that. So it was just a, an incredibly powerful moment this morning to take time to reflect. And I actually texted one of my buddies and I told him about my morning and I said, you know, this might be weird, like one guy sharing that with another guy. Yeah. Um, but I said I wanted you to hear that, and then I just said to him, I appreciate you as a friend, uh, and I appreciate the time that we get to spend together and reflect about the fire service and our friendship and all that. But I think moments like that, we don't take enough of them, which then doesn't allow us to truly reflect on what's important. Facts, man. And you know what? Uh, a lot of us, we don't do that enough. Right. The, I guess it's a humility or something as far as like the bravado, the macho man mm-hmm. uh, stuff that we walk around with. But, man, just to open up to another brother that understands the fire service and or sister, you know, um, that can actually identify with what we're talking about. That's big, man. All that stuff's huge. You it is. I, mean? I think I think where it comes from is guys like you and I um, that have a way of speaking and, and working with people and, and sharing our own stories when we're willing to be um, transparent enough to share something like that, yeah. I think it it allows, you know, if one more person agrees that, hey, it's okay if I do that, I think then we win. Oh, yeah, facts, man. I, I truly believe that my scars are the best identifier for myself. So mm. if I could go ahead and still peeling back the bandage, man, my scars are just visible. So I'm, I'm an open book and I'm willing to tell my story or whatever story that I have to tell. So in relation to that, as far as like adversity, talking about adversity to one of our brothers and or being down, marital situations, financial situations, we don't open up about that stuff. And that's Never. what, you know, takes takes a lot of takes a toll on on firemen, you know, and it becomes too much of a strain. And, and next thing you know, it's, you know, it leads to something else. So where did where did this come from for you to go to to go to New Hampshire? I mean, obviously, before I, we met in New Hampshire and you were speaking up there. Um, motivation is important for you. Uh, I see motivational speaker pop up every time I see your name. And I go, a lot of guys don't want to be known as a motivational speaker because there's there can be some negative connotation that goes with it, right? Because we, oh, yeah, you know, it's like a, it's like a smoke and mirrors. It's a, a salesman. You know what I mean? It can get yeah, sticky, yeah. right? Yeah. But that's not what you do. That's not who you are. No. So... I'll tell you for sure, like, just like you said, there comes some sort of connotation with that. Like, in my own department, you know, a lot of people don't appreciate, not that I mind that they don't or value um, how I speak or how outspoken I am or willing, willing to tell you some things that I struggle with. So the willingness and the humility that I'm willing to be like, hey, man, I'm good. You know what I mean? I see you bleeding, man. I just want to help you out. You know, just let me talk to you. And that stuff, it's a, it, um... It, it was embedded in me at a young age, man. I grew up in the church, you know? Mm. I started speaking in a church at a young age, 14, 15. I've been speaking on, on, you know, on a pew for a long time. So just speaking um, in, that, in that realm allowed me to open up, you know, and just speaking in a fashion of um, just being dirt poor, man, and just, you know, understanding that, you know, my mother couldn't provide, my dad couldn't provide, and I'm all right. I'm all right with that. And being all right with that allowed me to just formulate my thought and just be like, all right, man, whatever. Good. How old are you? I just turned 41, brother. I had a birthday on. A- God, you, you look like you're 25, for God's <laughs> sakes. I just turned Good for out. you. On September 4th, man, I just went. So on my birthday, I just went fishing, man. Went Happy to- birthday. Thank you. Thank you, brother. 41. 41, man. Big 4-1. Yeah, over that hump of the 40 now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. It's all downhill, bro. Um, 
real quick with that though, I mean, you're you're going back to your childhood, yeah. and you're remembering even during your childhood, even with the toughest cards that were dealt, you still found some solace that you were okay. That, oh, facts, yeah, yeah, but yeah. that that's not. It's not easy or, or the norm for, for a kid to, to have that rationale, no? I don't know. If I don't say if it's not easy, it's just who am I to say what type of life I was supposed to be living? I didn't know. I didn't know no other life. So, I mean, that was the only life yeah. I knew. So, Did that you, yeah. So, that actually just, it was comfort for me. And you found, I'm sure, a lot of comfort in the church, I would assume then. Yeah, yeah. Through the church, my, you know, it was a church going family. It was heavy in the church and, um that allowed me to find my voice. So I, I think faith is so important, regardless of the religion aspect of faith. I think yeah. faith, having faith you gotta matters. You got to believe in something. Got to believe in something. You got to believe in something, man. And, um, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. So in church, in those early days, I mean, you put yourself out in front of people and speaking. I mean, how old were you in the church when you were – Sharing a message like 14, or reading the gospel 14, 15, or, um, you know, 1415, just up there. So I never wrote anything. I never wrote anything. So really? Most of the times. Um, and by the time I did it or when I did my first one and I would just speak and um, I would just let whatever was inside of me. If I like sometimes um, if they were playing like on the piano, I would now messages are coming through me through music. Yeah. Through music, messages are coming through me, and just out of um, just the sheer willingness to share something, because I'm creating messages inside of my mind. They ask anybody if they want to speak. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to say something. And it's then coming through I, you. It's coming. I'm telling you, it was just like it's. It was pouring through me at a young age, man, and I knew it. I was a. I would write. I'm a poetry writer. Um, I write poetry, and I just would always. Um, Anything. If I come up with something on a bus ride somewhere, I'm jotting it down. You know, try you to still do that, that now. Up. Yeah, yeah. If I'm in you bed, do. yeah, yeah. So how how much of that is how good is that for you? How much do you need that 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 creative aspect, that ability to take your thoughts and to craft them into ideas? Um, it's got to be super important and probably an escape for you with your poetry and things like that. Yeah, so um, writing and reading were escapes for me. Mm. So, yeah, at a point in time where um, my mom would have to find me in the closet because I was just reading. No kidding. Oh, facts. Facts. Yeah. So yeah. And then, um, words. Then, like, um, when I would read new books, I would learn new words. Yeah. You know? And as a, you know, by ninth grade, I'm reading all these books. And then next thing I noticed, my conversations were strong. My conversations were strong, and that was through the words, the value of words. And so I started writing better um, through reading. I started reading bigger books. The bigger books allowed me to gain better vocabulary. Better vocabulary allowed me to go ahead and um, either um, articulate better and give you what I'm saying a little bit better, a little bit clearer, better communicator, better communicator, better um, person to go ahead and talk to you, teach you, tell you things. There's so much to that, man. Yeah, yeah I'm telling I, you. I, I, my kids are super amazing. My youngest, she's 16, going on like 25. Lily, you met her. Yeah, yeah, you met Lily. Yeah. She's cool. And, man. Ah, she's unbelievable. And she can carry a conversation. I mean, just the other day, the driving instructor had her out while she was getting her permit, putting her drive time in. And he comes back and he's like, I, I can't even begin to tell you what a, a joy she was to have, yeah. you know, as a, as a driving student. She goes, we chatted the whole time. She can carry a conversation and, and dive into it. And most 16-year-old kids don't engage or don't ask questions or are timid and shy. And she is yeah. uh, very much a person who can carry a conversation and be inquisitive and, uh, and like authentic. In, uh, in the firehouse, what, what are her limitations? Like, as far as like, what are her limits as far as what, what she can do and what she can't? Cause I know, so, yeah, she's a uh, volunteer and stuff. Yeah. So she's volunteering in our volunteer house. Um, and as a junior firefighter from 16 to 18, uh, they can do basic, it's mostly observation, but they can do uh, light types of stuff. Like she can shuffle equipment, uh, you know, during training, she could basically do everything. Yeah. Uh, they're not supposed to be uh, interior until after 18 for insurance reasons and stuff like that. Gotcha. But she can basically do anything else leading up to that. Cool. Um, and it's, you know, dependent upon the department, our department, we're, 
I want them to get exposure. So yeah. she's getting a taste of, of what it is, you know? Yeah, and I don't, good, yeah. I don't think it's going to be, it's not going to be a career. She wants to be a corporate attorney. She no, wants yeah, to go to, she, she told me she wants to go to DC. Yeah. Like she's got yeah. plans, man. She, she ain't going to be, <laughs> she ain't going to be me and you. You no. know what I mean? No, but, but I love the fact that she's willing to try something that is totally out of her comfort zone because I think she wants to challenge herself and also find a connection with her father that, you know, we're very close, but the relationship I have with her today versus what it was six months ago yeah. is night and day difference. Imagine night the story difference. she'll tell, you know? That's right. Imagine the story she'll tell and the, the things she'll be able to tell her children if she ever, you know, does have children as far as her relationship with you in that realm. Think about what the fire service has done for me and you. Yeah. Right? We have, I'm sure our stories are very, very different. However, the fire service delivers on a couple key things. And I want my daughter or anyone else that I know to experience that and walk away with the appreciation I have for what the fire service has done for me for the last 29, 30 years. Facts. Right? Facts. Yeah. Why wouldn't we want that for somebody? I, I actually recorded today. I, I, I recorded today an episode just by myself where I started going down the road of talking about culture and how do you measure culture? Culture. Mm -hmm. How do you measure culture? Good culture, bad culture? I think, and I heard this on a podcast and I'm crafting it into my own narrative, so I started playing around with it today on my own episode. But I said you, you capture that or, or you, you can rate your culture based on retention. Based on retention, okay. Do people want to be there? Are people... Are guys and are guys and girls in Miami Dade Fire Department are they going outside of your department to recruit their friends and family to come work for the same department they do? If they do, that means they value the job. If you don't have your own people actively recruiting to get the best into your job, then maybe there's something that's got to be looked at. Mm -hmm. And you could do that across the board, but that's part of that. That's part of that retention. Facts. People are staying. People aren't looking for another job. They're not looking to volunteer elsewhere. They're not looking for a paycheck somewhere else. They value where they are, and they want to stay and work there, and they're going to do everything they can to keep it as good, so they're going to go out and actively pursue and bring people in that represent the norms of that department, I think. right? Yeah. So I'm kind of like crafting a narrative around that, right? So right. anyway, I think it's important. I think the fire service offers so, so much for, for all of us. We yeah. just have to allow it to take hold of us and we have to trust in it. Yeah, the person I was day one to the person I am today, it's a drastic change. Me too. Drastic change, you know, I came in, I came in very hungry already, but I very, not that I came in timid, but I knew that this field I came in at 22, 23, whatever it was, was a truly intimidating field for myself. You know, black male, 23, um, my department, all those uh, multicultures, still a lot of, um, you know, still white males, a lot sure. of white males. So, um, you know, you still come in, you're just still so timid in this local government job. And I remember it was just a shell shock for me as far as like um, the food, the culture, you know, how to move around the station is the You had no, no connection to the fire service, right? Outside no, of no. you coming in. So you're the first one in your family, first generation, first well, exposure. My, my cousin was, uh, he became a fireman right out of high school as well, up north, just about um, two okay. hours away. And about, that was um, three years before I became a fireman. Got it. So I had, to wait, yeah, I had to wait a little bit when I put my application in. And uh, that, that was just, you know, him being up there and doing it, it was just hunger, man. Hunger. Hunger. And nobody knew why I would have run from my mom's house to the beach. No one knew. Every day. Every day. I would run. They, and nobody, nobody believed that I would get hired. Oh, so you were running to get in shape? Is that what you're saying? Not, like running, just, just because I had a, I had a doing dream. the work, just doing the work, just doing the hey. work. But you know, it took a long time. It took four, eight, four and a half years, five years or something, just to get hired. How did Miami you find Dade. it? Because of your uh, cousin, uh, Miami Dade Fire Rescue. Uh, pretty much, my cousin was a fireman, so I just started looking up mm. fireman stuff. You know, on the old internet, the AOL. So. You know, I get it. Start licking up stuff, and then I'm did he? Up. What was his exposure to it, though? I mean, was was he? Was that new to him also? So he had yeah. to navigate. He had to navigate that space for himself. So yeah. So um, somebody in high school, um, or when he was actually graduating, leaving football, football was not working out, and they was telling him just become a fireman because it was just either that or the streets. Same, yeah. same. For me, it was um, um, it was either that or the streets. 
Wow. It was out of that of the streets. Uh, my biggest deal breaker was the birth of my son and or my um, my first um, um, son, you know, um, girlfriend getting pregnant. That was my first deal breaker. Like, you got to do better. So um, I was telling my son, my first son, that you saved my life, that you saved my life. Because I would say, man, um, without you, I wouldn't have the, the drive or the motivation to become better, to become great. So um, that comes and, from within, my man. Yeah. That's, you know, he's, he, he might have, but that comes from within, wanting more, being yeah. better, right? Uh, so my mother left a, a, a crazy imprint on all of our lives. One of my things my mother did, my mother, um, she probably never made more than $23,000 a year, right? She was able to secure a, a house in North Miami Beach with my father. My father, not that he was ever somebody rich, probably never made 35, 40 grand a year, but they were still able to, you know, meet the American dream. Yeah. Buy a home, buy a house, get all their kids inside of the house. And from whatever, for whatever it was worth, she was able to always um, let us know, you know, don't be like me. She was a laborer. She was a, you know, laborer. She goes to work and she was a servant. One of the things my mother would always tell us is to be better than me. Be better than me. Don't be like me. And she was very, she was very regiment in that. Yeah. The most disciplined person I've ever met in my life. Wow. So um, her regiment is actually, um, she truly injected that inside of all of us. Be better than me. Be great. You know? So that's, that's why I live. And that's why I continue to push my message, man. And that's why you provide and, take, and do the same for your kids. Facts. Facts. And I try to make sure I stay stern and stay disciplined and make sure they understand exactly you're not just going to get handouts. Mm. You know? I watched your son... How old was your son in New Hampshire? Oh, the 13 year old, old Miles, yeah. <laughs> I saw him pulling lines. Yeah, that kid. I saw oh. him rolling hoes. Yeah. He was putting in some work, and he, he doesn't do that at home, right? Like the fire service, no, right? I, mean, like I, I brought him around some of my trainings. Don't, so when I do a lot of my training, it's live fire, so it's a lot of, a lot of smoke. So, sure. Um, so it's hard to bring him around that. Sure. Well, he's been there, he's been exposed to a lot of the training. If we're having just hands-on stuff where it's not really, you know, just flowing water, he's been there. He's been a part of it. He's seen it. But sometimes I'm just too busy, you know. No, I get that. Uh, but but I think my, my point of that was he could have sat back and, and hung yeah, out with his dad. Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah. he got involved with a group of kids that he knew nothing about. Oh, yeah. And that dude, he was... <laughs> He Look at the funny, grin on man. your face. That's, dude, funny. that's he such ready, a proud man. dad yeah, face man. right now. He was, uh, he was truly ready, man. He was highly, he's a highly engaging kid. Awesome. So, yeah, he actually gets along with just about anyone you see. If you got, you were upstairs at one point, he actually got in line with them when they were actually um, um, going to go eat inside of the mess hall just to go eat. And he gets in line and they're, they're, uh, they're doing like a march. <laughs> and he's like marching with him and stuff. I and love I'm it. Like, Yo, this is, this kid is Hell crazy. yeah. So, that's that's fun, man. Those are the moments as parents, like I'm doing with my kids now, especially Lily in the firehouse. It's like, it's just those moments, man. They're they're priceless, you know. And it comes, they come from a foundation from which we've provided, that's and it, fair. you know, and and you know, your you 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 spoke about your parents in such an endearing way that like, you know, they 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 might not have been able to give you everything you you materialistically wanted, but they gave you a home and a solid base and introduction to church. And I think that is what we're missing today more than ever is core values and principles that we need to be teaching. Yeah. And for us, I mean, me and my brothers and sisters, um, by the time we knew that we were, we were poor and we had no money, we was like, okay, um, what, what they could give us, that's enough. Yeah. That's enough. That's good enough for us. Wow. Um, so we didn't, we didn't ask for, we didn't ask for much. Um, we understood that, um, you know, my mom would actually, she would never turn on the AC and, uh, or sometimes, you know, she'll tell us to turn off the lights. It, you know, it takes a little while to understand that stuff, but, yes, you know, we didn't have it like that. So at some, at one point, we were just, we understood. Message received. So, I mean, you know, my older sister would always tell us, man, we just, we just have to do what, what, what she says or what my dad says, you know, just to live like that. No, I absolutely get it. Absolutely. So talk to me then about the fire service. When you found it, it took you a couple oh, of years to get in, but... I mean, you knew nothing about it. So I knew nothing about the fire service. My brother had gone to, uh, to prison, and I was going to mm. go. I wanted to become a Marine. Uh, okay. you know, 
So I want to become a military, uh, go to the military. A lot of my family members are in the military, Marines, Air Force, um, Army, a lot of a lot of my family members. So Will was, Will's was ready to just either do that, military, or um, some type of servanthood. Right. So in a in a realm of servants. So the next thing that came to me, if it's not that, um, the next best thing is I want to be a fireman. Mm. You know? Um, so by that time I was so engaged, uh, on my route to becoming a fireman, I found books, um, literature, anything, anything that I found, I would, You're a reader. I, I was, I would dissect it. It was, it was nothing. It was, I would dissect that book. There was a, I went to a seminar for, um, Don McNee fire school. It cost me $59. <laughs> It cost me fifty nine dollars. I'm telling you, I have no idea how I got that fifty nine dollars. Yeah, I went there. I caught the bus downtown um, to Miami. I went to that seminar, and at the seminar, they gave you the free book. With the you go there and you you take in the seminar. I had, a, and by the time I left, my little notebook thing was filled with notes. I had my little um, my book. They gave me my free book. I was I ate that book up in a day, ate that book up in a day. I had nothing else to do. I had nothing else Hungry. to do. I was, I was out of school, you know, just just always pacing, you know, like thinking like, man, either go back outside, go to a corner, you know, make some dollars real quick or just go ahead and, and grind. So and my, it, my, yeah. my release was just run. And what did it look like? Your first uh, your first day, your first week, hey, month, so, year? It was uh, my first shift was the craziest shift of my life. <laughs> So yeah, man. So my first shift, I had a jury duty. Oh really? My first shift out of recruit academy, I had jury duty, right? So I have jury duty. I'm stationed in North Miami Beach. North Miami Beach is where my mom lives. So ladder 31. I'm stationed in ladder 31. Go to ladder 31. By the time I get to the station, it's about 8:40, 9 o'clock or something like that. I was telling one of the chiefs that last night. So I get there, and um, that's kind of like a slow house. So I didn't know it was a slow house, but I get there, check out the truck. I'm trying to find anybody that I could talk to. Nobody's there. And I'm like looking in the dormitories. Everybody's like kind of asleep or like either racked out. I don't know. I've never been there. So I'm just like, I check the truck out for like two hours, go do the dishes, like 11 something now, closing in on 12. And I'm just like, man, do I go to sleep? Do I, what I do, what do I do? So at that point, I'm just standing in the kitchen, uh, probably made a little too much noise and the guy comes out. He's like, yo, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, I don't know, sir. I was just. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> right? so, I, don't, I don't know. I don't so, really don't yeah. know. Yeah. So he spent some time with me a little bit, like 20, 30 minutes. Um, we go downstairs, look at the truck again. Um, you know, tells me a couple of things. And then he shows me my dormitory. So about 3 o'clock, 3.30 a.m. In the so, morning. In the morning now, the tones drop. So the tones drop. And I'm like, oh, what the hell? So and they're like, hey, hey, pro, where can you get up? So I get up. It would go down. I get I get down there quick. There's a pole. So you go down the pole. You slide down the pole at ladder 31. Ladder 31, you slide down the pole, get in the rig. I'm on the right step. So I'm on the right step, get in there, get packed. I'm, I'm ready. My face, everything's on. I mean, prematurely, you know. I'm just rook. So I'm just like, all right. So now for sure, um, I'm dressed out. Everybody, they're slow to get there. And I'm just there. And I'm, you know, I'm just there sweating inside of my face mask. I'm just like getting my heart rate. It's like at least 140 probably. <laughs> um, officer gets in the rig and he's like, yo, this is a real one. Sure as, it, sure as hell, man. We get down, it's Eastern Shores. So Eastern Shores, this is like a rich neighborhood. I've never been in the house. I've never seen houses that big in my life. Right, right, right. I've never seen houses that big in my life. We get there um, and I could see the column of smoke. <laughs> I, I'm talking about my- This is your I, very first run? My very first shift. Yes, sir. That's wild. You know, so when I see the column of smoke, my heart's just like pounding, racing. I'm like, no way, bro. This is crazy. This is crazy. So I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't even know what to do. I'm just so nervous. So anyways, I know I'm on the right step. Um, he's going to either tell me to get the nozzle, but we're on a ladder. So I'm like, I'm going to put a ladder. Um, I'm going to get the hook and can because now we're, we're, we're third in or something. But they tell the ladder to move up, move to the front. So I get the hook and can, get the ladder. I'm just stay, stay, staying outside. He said, all right, come on, Rook. He takes me out. We start doing some stuff. And uh, by the time we get to the front door, he changes my, um, he gives me new direction. New direction now, go get the ladder. So now we hustle up to the, to the front door, go get the ladder. The ladder, for some reason, is on the ground. Get the ladder off the ground. Go ahead. He tells me where to throw the ladder, throw the ladder. I throw the ladder upside down. Throw the ladder upside down, right? 
I and love this, it. This guy is, is going, he's going in on me. What the hell? He's going in. Right. And then me, I'm just like, I'm scared. I'm nervous. You know, 23 year old. It's my first. Totally year, overwhelmed. My first yeah. day. And I'm like, all right. And I'm just taking it, just taking it, the assault, the, the verbal abuse, everything. So I flip right. the ladder back, get the ladder back up and raise it up. Raise the ladder right all the way up. So the fire department, Miami Day, we, we didn't know at that time truly what impact glass was. Mm. Right? So now I go up, he's like, hey, break that glass on the second level. Go up, try to break the glass on the second level. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. <laughs> right? I get it, man. I gave, I gave it a second go, and he's like, get the hell down here. So I go downstairs, I knock out, I go down the ladder, and he sends the other guy up. I'm just half over, just trying to catch my breath. Sends the other guy up, the other guy goes up, same, same thing. thing. So we're like, what the hell is that? It's type, it's type of super glass, sir, right? Um, so now he's like, all right, um, chief wants us to get on that line and get inside, grab your hook, we're going inside, we're going to try to pull some ceilings. Man, get in there, man. Those ceilings were so high, I've never seen, like I told you, <laughs> I've, never seen, I've never seen a house so big in my life, right? <laughs> So I looked at yeah. this house, I'm looking, I'm like, who the hell lives here? Like, you know, like, who yeah, lives right. this house, right? Yeah, the house is so it's big, so it's big. not smoke like, down to the yeah, floor, right? The ceilings no. are so high, right? Yeah. There's no smoke right. on the first level, but, the, you know, we have to go. Now he's like, we got to get on the line, we got to go upstairs, get to the second level. Get to the second level, now we're in the devil's mouth, right? Mm. Now he's like, put the hook to the side, the chief wants us to relieve these guys on the line. So we get on the line, and now at this point... The, my, my other guy, he gets on a nozzle because I'm a little winded and tired. I'm exhausted, man. This guy's been having me run around doing all this stuff. So now I'm just back up on a line. I'm just trying to hold my weight up. I barely could do that. Right? So now he's fighting fire a little bit. I'm just like they're trying to lean on the ground. And you, I, see, I see the amount of fire. And I'm just like, yo, this is wild, bro. This is wild. Um, and then, um, so we've been doing it for a little while. Nothing's happening. This, you know, we're trying to knock it down. I don't know what was on fire still, but I know the amount of smoke up there. I couldn't see anything. And right. the amount of fire there. So, um, anyways, they call us to go down to rehab. A lot of 31 come down to rehab. We're just standing by the front door. Foot door, I grab my hook and can, and I'm just over there. Driver changes my bottle. I just bend over. Driver changes my bottle, bend over, just waiting to, you know, go back in. Mayday goes out. Oh, shit. Yeah. My first, my very first fire, a mayday goes out. I'm like, hold on, man. I've learned this in recruit training, right? And I'm just thinking to myself, there is no way, like, this is happening right now. This is crazy. This is crazy. And my, my first, my very first shift, and then they come down. They finally bring the guy out. The guy pulls his mask off, snot running down his nose. And I'm just thinking to myself, um, after everything's over, like, and by the time I, the, the, I was relieved that morning, and the guy goes, he's like, you good, Rook? I'm like, yeah, man. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah. You know? I'm going to need a three weeks to unpack all this. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah. So and that was my introduction to the fire service. And, um, Christening by fire. Facts, man. And I, you know, I always tell people or whenever I instruct anybody, I always tell all my students I became a fireman on year six. On year six, I became a fireman. So... What does that mean? That doesn't mean mm. that I wasn't um, into the job or I didn't understand. Year six, I almost lost my life on a fire, right? So or whatever, I could have fell through a hole. You know, we had a pretty big fire. And or something that um, impressioned me enough that, man, I better take this thing serious. So they only always... talk about that a little bit. Oh, yeah. I talk about that to my recruits. Um, yeah. So, I mean as far as like me being impressioned by that fire and understanding exactly what I'm in. This is not, this is the job. When you sign up, you could die on day one, right? So when is it when you hit that moment that, okay, you understand it? Is it day one, right? Is it day one that you truly understand it? Because no, you don't. You don't. You're a probie firefighter. All you're thinking about is I can't mess up. I can't mess up. I got to do my job. I got to be perfect, right? But truly and honestly, I'm being... As honest as I am, I became a fireman on year six. On year six, I dedicated myself to the craft. I dedicated myself to the craft to further understanding exactly what it is that I'm doing, understanding building construction, reading smoke, understanding the conditions, understanding what I'm going into because I could die, right? Just to go back home to my family. So on year six, I became a fireman. And that was, that was a moment where um, that was a, a, a humility check for you. You got jammed up in a fire. 
Facts. Facts. So, I mean, just a lot of things were happening. Um, brothers on the other side having to retreat. Me on this side. My partner going down the side of a whole other, you know, fire behind me. All that type of stuff. Yeah. So you're just thinking, like, how did I get here in that moment? And, you know? and when, you, when you say that, you're saying that metaphorically over the last six years to that fire, not just that moment at that fire, but right. it was yeah. all your time leading up. And it's what are you doing from year one? or from day one to year six, all those moments prepared you for that moment. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, um, and that was just like a reality check. A lot of people, a lot of people ask me, cause from, the, from the first, those years, I was just having fun. I was at Firehouse 7, you know? Mm. And that was like, a, they always say uh, Station 2 is our, um, that's pretty much our, that's our sister station, but that's like college and you go to Firehouse 7 and it's like a, a frat club. But, Got it. <laughs> so, but we trained a lot and we had a lot of fun. We did a lot of realistic training and all that stuff throughout all those years. And I was there for close to 12, 12 years at Firehouse 7. Um, and by the time I matured as a fireman and I understood the profession, where I started to go ahead and delve deep inside of understanding the profession and mm. dedicate myself to the craft, you know, I separated myself. I separated myself because I wanted to become that guy where they... We're like, hey man, um, hey Dorval, um, what, what do you? Uh, oh yeah, let me show you. If you didn't have that fire, would you have had that moment? Uh, would you have gone all in like to figure to to pursue this profession to to truly understand it, unpack it, and learn it? I believe so because there were a lot of times where like um, my officer would ask me certain things, like he's like, hey, what's that? And I I couldn't answer him, you know, or you know, mm. FBC or you know. Um, you know, things that were on the buildings that I couldn't, I didn't know how to identify or a riser, you know, things like that. It was simple things. And it became embarrassing. It became embarrassing. It was humiliating to me to call myself a professional fireman. I can't identify certain things that firemen should know, you know, like, um, so stuff like that started becoming important to me. You started taking ownership. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there's a lot of things that you can't tell me that I didn't dedicate myself to this craft, but what a what a strong message, man, because you know how many guys shy away from a conversation or back away from a circle when they're feeling unsure, they don't have the answers. And instead of doing what you're doing right now or starting to take ownership of that, they just fade away, hoping that they'll never be called upon to know that answer or when it's on the fire ground and when it actually matters and they're going to be responsible for it and they can't act. Oh, facts, because uh, what happens is the biggest platform that you can be handed is to give you, give you a moment to teach your peers and watch how quickly you shrivel up. But so they're reluctant because they don't want to look or feel incompetent. But that's your moment. That's your moment. So now is your time to let us know that you don't know this information. Now is the time to make your mistakes. Now is the time to go ahead and share with us what do you know so we can build on it. And that's called foundation, man, you know? Mm. So that I stuff like that is just like... It's gold, man. It's gold. But you have to be willing to, you know, show your humility is a big thing. It goes a long way. Humility is a big thing. goes a long way. So you have to be willing, like I said, to show your scars. And let us know what you don't know because as brothers, if you're going to be sitting to the left or the right of me, I got to know what your deficiencies are. And at the same time, you're going to know what my deficiencies are. That way, I know every day we're going to go home to our families. And we balance out, brother. <sighs> Man, there's so much. That is, I hope people that are listening to this really understand the value in what you just said because I would say more often than not, the guys sitting around us are pretending that they know more than they do and they're not willing to take ownership or look at the humility of it, right? Being humble. Yeah, yeah being humble is a big deal. Not easy, bro. Not easy, man. Not easy. Not easy. Do you talk about this in your when you, when you speak? I mean, is this like when you, so you talked about uh, you're going to be the lead instructor for a new class that's coming in. Right? Very soon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Messages like this, I think, resonate because there's going to, every single one of your recruits will have those moments of uncertainty where they try to power through it by pretending or burying their head in the sand and not taking ownership of it. And I think a message from a guy like yourself, yeah. where you tell them, listen, this is part of the process, right? Oh, we yeah. tell you to trust the process. This is the fucking process. This is it. This is it. This is it. So one of the biggest quotes I always tell my recruits, I tell every class, man, your physical traits will not define you. Your heart will. 
So, and through Love that, it. through that same message is your, as far as like identifying whatever your limitations are, you know, when your limbs fail you, when all that stuff fails you, your mind will make you do um, impossible things, impossible things. But how do you get there? How do you get there? You get there through building blocks, man. Yes. So you cross that line in the sand. I already told you, I'm going to tear you down. I'm going to build you up. I'm going to break you apart. I'm going to break you apart. I'm going to break you apart, not just because you're incomplete, but I want to make sure that I understand who I'm building. You know? Um, so oh, I do. Through that, it's just, uh, that's just a foundation. I'm just trying to give you something. You go out, I'm here to mold minds and make day one firemen. Right? When you come into this academy. So when you go out, the guys outside in operations, they're going to build you up further. But I'm going to give you a foundation so you can go out, so you can be a competent person, competent fireman, and be smart. So the willingness to share that type of story like that, like, you, you kind of pull that story out of me. So do I share it often like, like that in that format? Probably not, but all the stories always come out differently. Yes. Know? So. I got it. Well, I want to play something, um, whether yeah. you like it or not. I'm going to do it. Um, stand by. Oh, Where'd God. it go? Oh, God. <laughs> hang on. Hang on. Hang on. I had it. Here it is. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear it or no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a process, man. What was that? Class 146? Is that what you said? Was that a, just an a impromptu motivational kick in the ass? Yeah, I was driving um, driving to the, to, the, to the training center that morning, and I was just hyped up, man. Ah, I, I was it. hyped up, and I was like, I was running PT for that morning, and they were down the day before, you know? And that message was, it just came out of me, so... Speaking from the heart. Oh, yeah, from the heart, man. Not but, scripted. No, 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 no script. No script. Great. Goes back to your church day. The music was playing, man. The music of the fire ground was playing, and it was, and you just, you, you put it together. Yeah, man. I, Bro, moments like that, that class is not going to forget that moment. Oh, no, I still get, I still get text messages, man, about that, man. And they're like, man, you don't know what you did for me. And I'm like, yeah, man, I, you don't know what you did for me. You know? There's that. Yeah. There's that. You know, I was I was looking at a couple things online, right? I do a little bit of homework, you know, when I when I talk with guys and 
so on. And I look at, like, different things that are out there and where people are mentioned and so on. And like I said, you know, this motivational speaker, but it's it always says around your name that you will not forget this conversation or experience. Yeah. You, bro, it comes from the heart. It's It's spoken with a true passion. And what's incredible was... As I'm going through some of your content, I'm looking at clips like that. You're a very soft-spoken guy. Yeah. Like, at least the, the guy I know, the guy that I met in New Hampshire in the, in the <laughs> conversations. And then, right. and then, bang, man, like that. And that is what I love. It's like, you know, walk quietly, carry a big stick, right? Facts, man. Facts. So, I like a lot of, the, a lot of my students say when I start teaching, I become a different person. Yes. Um, I'm so passionate about it. I'm so passionate about this profession that I do become a, a, a different person because I'm in a different realm now. Now, you know, when I start talking to you about um, fire suppression or search and rescue or rapid intervention, it's a different realm. Now it involves you in understanding the tactics, how to keep yourself and your brothers and your sister safe and or how to save a life. So it's, it's uh, you know, I can't be um, soft toned anymore because I want to project myself in a fashion where you understand how urgent this is and how much it matters to me. So now my tone has to reflect exactly what I mean and exactly how important this is to me. So I can't speak to you in a monotone voice while I'm teaching you a lesson. I got to make sure you understand. That. I got to make sure that message comes across as being as real as possible. And it's all but real because it's authentic. It's who you are. The oh, passion, yeah. right? I mean, like you, you have you, bro. The process that you put in, like you trusted in this process. You came as an outsider that only read up and took a class and then got thrown into to your first day with fire. Like you didn't know what to expect, right? And now 17 years later, in the last two years being in a, in a leadership, a company leadership position, you've gone all in because you trusted in this process, right? Yeah, facts, man. You got to go all in. You got to go all in. And if you don't, if you're half-stepping... That's where people get hurt, man. That's where people get hurt. So you, you can't mm. have step this profession. You can't, man. This is a blue collar job. You got to do blue collar work, man. And blue collar work requires you to go ahead and just roll up your sleeves. And, you know, you got to get your hands a little bit dirty. Not even just a little bit dirty because sometimes the ground is real. And, you know, there's going to be those sleepless nights. You just got to thug it out, man. You know? how, do you, how do you instill that message in these new recruits? How so, do you? Yeah, yeah please. So the disconnect is real now, right? Mm. So the disconnect is real, which is something that we're learning, right? We're learning that. Um, is, it, is it truly a, a disconnect as far as like their reality and our reality? Yeah. Our reality was different. Their reality is different. But the nature of it or their understanding of it is still the same. It's just that their adversity was not our adversity, you know? Um, so what they're going through is not what we were going through. We didn't understand the... The how would uh, electronics and the the web, uh, the internet will have affected us throughout these years. So all that stuff that they're provided more advancements as far as technology has transformed their train of thought, has transformed their train of thought. So when they come in here, they're not thinking um, outside of the box no more if they're not open to that and or more methodical teachings unless they're raised like that. And how did I formulate a thought like that? So pretty much what I'm, what I'm thinking is like, okay, how do I get to them? Mm. They always say when you speak to pediatrics, you got to go ahead, you got to get to their level, so you got to take a knee, right? So you got you to take a knee. You got to take a knee, you got to get down to their level. It's not saying I'm going to dumb it down for them. All I'm saying is when I portray my message, my message will be portrayed in a fashion that will go ahead and um, you know, see if we can get inside of your life in that way when I tell them that message. And for the delivery's got to delivery's got to meet the audience. Facts, man. Facts, man. And one of the things I always tell my students is what I'm about to teach you is nothing new. I've read a lot of books about the fire service and stuff I'm teaching now, even from people around the country. You look at old New York, old Chicago, they've been doing this forever. All it is is just we're just regurgitating the information in the way we do it. So what happens is how do they gravitate towards one instructor more than another is delivery. How do you deliver the message, right? How do you deliver the message? So, so now what happens is students will actually be more in tune to go to this instructor because the way he delivers his message, I get it. 
I understand. I understand. And or it reflects in a fashion where they can they can actually go ahead and relate to that. It's so important to put the work in as a as an instructor, right? It's just like being a it's, yeah. it's just like being a company officer, right? Like yeah. you got to know your people and then you have to know how to get to them. Yeah, man. If if you're not willing to put the time in, right? If you're not willing to, as a company boss, you're not willing to learn the three guys that you're responsible for on your tour. And you don't know what individually makes each guy tick or you don't know how to individually impress upon a a, a a conversation or issue with each guy in their way so yeah. that you can affect the most out of them, then you're not doing your job correctly. Nah, it's the not. same with teaching. Facts, man. Facts, man. And everything that you do to build upon your execution as an instructor is your experience. Yes. Your experience will aid you 100%, 100% of the times. So when you go in there and you start lecturing about something, and you can add in or benefit if you can add a story, a story to go ahead and give them a vision or something that they can, you know, they can see or, oh, I get it. You were in this fire and this would happen because, okay, this is why you're talking about this in this lecture. And they can add on it in your stories and how you express yourself, man. Um, but, yeah, man, you got to know your people, man. You got you to spend that time. That's the, that's the biggest benefit of the fire service. That's one of the things I learned. So you talk about sisterhood, brotherhood, man, and that stuff, man. You, Outside of the station, you have station outings, and you learn people. You learn people, man. And that For me, when I do recruit training, one of the biggest things is learning them as individuals, man. I got to. I got to. I got to know who you are. So when they call me about you, I be like, oh, yeah, that kid's good, man. He actually has uh, good parents, you know. They raised him right. Or this and that. You know, he went to school for this. You know, that guy's a, he actually is a mechanic. You can use him around the house, or he's a plumber. So stuff like that, when you learn people, that's a big deal, so old firemanship that's how it was so these guys came from um you know those type of jobs they were handymen and that was a benefit for the fire service so if you that's know right. that you share that with your brothers outside in the outside in operations they'd be like oh yeah he's a builder i'll put him to work we got some walls to build and stuff we got to paint you know do that's some right. station uh, station stuff yeah i love that man i there's so much to that um i think though you talked about experience real quick um this is a job that requires experience. Facts, yeah, 100%. And the only way you get experience is with time. Yeah. And opportunity. Facts. And some guys get experience quicker than other guys do. Some, some guys don't get the experience in 25 years that some guys get in the first 18 months. Mm -hmm. That's the interesting thing about this job. And so I, I then have to ask, like, as you teach and explain the process, how do we teach patience patience and the importance of experience when it comes to firefighting especially with our younger guys man that's a, that's a tough one man because i know it is that's why i wanted to challenge you with it that's because every wrong. i think we all struggle with this it's definitely we all struggle with it man. definitely upbringing upbringing is a big deal man you know, and it will fall back on your parents as much as you would hate to admit that it falls back on your upbringing and it falls back on who you are as a person. So, mm. so it falls back on who you are as a person. It falls back who you surrounded yourself. Not that who you surrounding yourself is who you're going to become, but what they, they provide you with as far as like um, some sort of mentorship or somebody you can relate or look to and be like, man, I want to be like that person. So talk to me about mentorship then. Did you have mentors in the Miami-Dade Fire Department or maybe outside of the department that you leaned on? Well, obviously, my first mentor was my mother, the most disciplined person I ever met in my life. Um, and uh, awesome. inside of the fire department, I mean, um, we still have our, our legendary Captain Bill Gustin, but uh, mm -hmm. I have a brother, I'm Reginald McKnight. Um, this guy's his leadership skills is uh, bar none, probably the best leadership skills I've ever seen in my life. Um, a female firefighter who was a Marine, Michelle Alvarado. I lean on those two. Those are my rocks, man. And, um, I love it. Right now. So, I mean, as far as like the value in them, it's, uh, it's amazing. I have a lot of brothers and sisters that I spend time with from George Kabaz that I pull things from great storytellers that could share things with me, you know, so. you know, I, um, I remember years ago being asked and I'm talking years ago, asked like mentor, like who's your mentor, who in the fire service was your mentor. There were a couple guys that I thought were influential, but I never really had one or two people that I deemed to be my true mentors. Mm -hmm. Fast forward several, several years later, especially where I am today, and I've come to really understand 
how important mentorship is. Yeah. I didn't understand that as a pompous know-it-all fireman. <laughs> I didn't I didn't recognize how important that was because for so long I had all the answers. Yeah. I didn't I didn't need to be tutored. I didn't need to learn more or to be a uh, to be in the audience while others performed around me and just to watch their performance which makes me better. I didn't value any of that. Yeah. And it, it came with, and you said the word before, maturity. For me, I finally grew up. I finally had that moment of clarity and maturity within my fire service journey. Yeah, man. Where I realized, where I realized that mentorship is absolutely important. And to take it one step further, if you don't have anyone in your house, and you don't have anyone that can directly be a mentor for you, if you have that environment where you can't find somebody... You can still find someone across the entire fire service or double down that the fire service becomes your mentor. The people like you who are sharing a solid message can become mentors to those that don't have anybody in their immediate zip code. Yeah, I was just about to piggyback on that. So do it. There's a form of informal mentorship. Yes. So I don't have to be right next to you. And now this day and age, I mean, they're afforded the ability to go online and accept you know, our rocky internet service back then was pretty rocky. You go on there, it might be a chance, it might disconnect, you might see it, it might shatter out, but um, internet service is amazing now. So you could go on there, you go on YouTube, and you might find somebody that becomes engaging to you, you want to follow them, read up on them. That's an informal mentorship. You don't have to be side by side by these individuals. You don't have to, but you can, if you ever get a chance to meet them, be like, thank you, mentor. They don't know what you take them for, you know, just thank them. I saw you do that. I saw your Instagram where you have your arm around people that you credited with being a part of your journey. I saw a picture yeah. with Ray McCormack and, and Mike Champo that, you know, at these conferences. And I do the same thing. I find myself so influenced by how these guys carry themselves yeah. in their every day that I want to be more like that every single day. Facts, man. And you don't have to emulate that person to the T. Nobody's telling you. That's right. And emulate that person to the T. What we're telling you is as a form of informal mentorship or mentorship in itself is what can you pull away from this individual that you want to become, you know, and or you want to be um, something like that, you know, so there's that, yeah, there's nothing better than to watch the interaction between guys that are just dialed in and get it and watch how they interact with one another. Facts. Yeah. There's just, there's just something so authentic about that that I hope for myself that my interactions with people come off as that sincere and true because I'm working hard every single day to constantly cement relationships and trust. And I think, I think that is such a big part of all of this oh, is yeah. being influenced by those around you with a positive message. I think the negative takes over so much of the conversation all the time, and yet we're surrounded with so much good, mm -hmm. but we just don't see it as often as we see the bad. So do the work, right? Just do the, do work. the work. So a lot of people will see you and be like, okay, this guy's just trying to be on a platform, right? But, and then a lot of other people are be like, man, I needed that message today. I needed that message today. So, so funny you, you say that. You, know, you, yeah. you, you jump on that, you jump on that mic and you say something, someone somewhere needed to hear that message. Someone somewhere needed to hear that message and you gave them that opportunity or you gave them that benefit by sharing yourself, exposing yourself, making yourself vulnerable <laughs> by getting on that platform, speaking what you know to your truths, your facts, your values and all that stuff. You go ahead and display who you are and make yourself vulnerable to the world. When you do, you reap the reward personally for that. As much as you make yourself vulnerable, you you are making a difference or putting yourself out there to potentially help someone else. And, you know, it's funny. I was just having this conversation, man, and, and not too long ago with somebody. And I said, you know, all the naysayers and shit talkers aren't the one that needs to hear your message. But the guys that you don't hear from, think about how many people you've impressed upon something yeah, facts. through your conversation. Big facts. And, and those are the ones that we want to fuel. 
And when you do get that message, uh, when after you speak and somebody waits for you when you're done speaking to come up and say hello and just share a personal story with you and yeah, just man. say thank you for your message, that trumps all the bullshit times 100. So for every nice... For every nice comment I get, I can I can tolerate a hundred shit talkers. Yeah, and I love I love every minute of it. Isn't that an amazing thing, man? Somebody's just waiting to shake your hand just because it's something you said. It's uh, um, I'm still not used to it. Um, yeah. I do get it. I get it often, and I'm super grateful for that. Yeah, man. But there are so many incredible people, and that's why I still do this podcast six years later, is because I get to share people like yourself with the community that I've built because I want to put on guys that I think share a, a very positive message and in a, in a, in a, in a way about them that, that we need to emulate. And that yeah. is what we do when we take care of the job. We share the, we share the guys and girls that are making this job better. That's it. Oh, yeah. When Mike told me I was going to get to meet you, man, I was, you're re- like, ridiculous. I was, I was giddy, man. I'm, t- I'm not even lying, dude. I don't even I don't know what that means. Me- you're Dumb. I'm, I'm telling dumb. you right. I'm telling you right now. When Mike said you were gonna be there, I was like, "No way, bro. No way." You know. But that's what happens. Is so now you I look forward just for that meeting, that opportunity, just to shake your hand and tell you thank you for you know the message that you constantly deliver throughout the world. So how do you impact multiple people? You go onto this platform, the World Wide Web, the stuff that they created. I say World Wide Web. Now we're at, you're dating ourselves, right? You're showing what, your age. Yeah. What do they call it? What do they call it now? Just the internet. I don't the, know. the internet. The yeah. The internet. So I mean, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal because that platform you can actually speak to so many people. I get people from Germany, from uh, from e- Europe, or just random people. You know, China. I had a guy fireman from China text me. You know, like on whatever Facebook. I'm like, this is crazy. This is crazy. So how would I have ever been able to do that? without this format, without this format. But you know, if I ever do get the opportunity, because uh, there's a lot of hate about um, this format of delivering a message that a lot of firemen in our, in our country currently don't like. But you know, you can always find us when we get down and dirty, you can come talk to us and you know, and we could put uh, the rubber to the road. Yeah, that, and how about just the guys from all over the world that are seeking out something more? Facts, man. And so there's opportunity. And that's what I was getting at before about opportunity. Today, more than ever, people can find something they're looking for. Oh, yeah, value. There's value in that. There's, value there's in tremendous that. value. Yeah, man. I love it, man. What a what a fun conversation. What's next for you? You got the training academy coming up. Yeah, That's got to be exciting. That's going to own you, I'm sure. That becomes uh, that takes you off the, uh, off the trucks then, I assume? Yep. I'm going to be out of operations for a little while. Um, try to give back to, uh, to the department and, uh, you know, build up some recruits. So starting October, uh, the class starts October 15th, but how many guys and girls, it's going to be 50, man. So we got 50 bodies going to, uh, uh, minimum standards, which is just, uh, the Florida state fire standard college. They're going to be going to the college. They'll come to us later. And we got the, a certified class coming directly to us. So we have about a hundred and something firemen. So does that quicken the process then for getting them into the firehouses? Um, for the minimum standards, they're probably going to be at it for about seven, seven months. But uh, for the ones okay. that are certified, they're going to take about three, three, four months. Okay. To get them out awesome. there, uh, get a standard operating procedure. By October, October, I'm going to be up in uh, uh, Apopka. I want to say Apopka, Florida. I've never been over there. I've never been, <laughs> I never, I never been over there. But yeah, we're gonna be teaching, man, with Nate Sturm and a, a couple of guys from Bears from the Oath, and also um, the Dagum cadre teaching yeah. the red operations and engine ops. So I'll be over there from ten seventeen to ten twenty. Um, awesome. Down with those boys, man, and um, it's nothing like um, the firemanship. So we're gonna be at Nate Sturm's house, cooking it up and chopping it up, and um, you know, and that'll be that, man. And then start start just getting ready for next year, wherever I'm gonna be. You know the the fuel of all of that, right? Like, that's what I look at. I leave this Wednesday. I go on a trip for almost a week. I'm going to be I'm gonna be in Little Rock speaking at the First Thing Conference. Uh, I got asked to speak at the Little Rock Fire Department's uh, graduation ceremony for the new guys coming on the line. I'm going to be doing a keynote at the graduation in oh. Little Rock, which is just super cool. Um, I haven't done a fire school graduation before, so I'm excited to <laughs> yeah. talk to them about the process. I just I love it. Um, and then, uh, and then I'm going to travel off and do some stuff with a buddy of mine and, uh, and so on and just in, in love the fire service. And 
that to me is as much as the travel is uh, a lot and it's time consuming that is fuel man that's that keeps this going yeah and i'm sure it's the same for you yeah it does man and just being with those guys they're genuine guys Mm. man they became brothers man those are my brothers for real truly and honestly man i get to teach and do what i love and just you know and just it's a it's a benefit for me man just to grow with them and i'm growing in the fire search with them when i go there i learn things i bring it back and i'm sure with them you know they allow me to continue to share my message and they allow me to get down with them so i love it my man (laughs) thank you thanks for joining me today Thank what a great you. conversation. Amazing. Raymond Dorval, you're killing it, bro. You're doing good things for the fire service. Uh, we need more Instagram videos of you screaming and yelling and talking about the value of the job. Uh, thank you. You didn't know I was going to play that today, and I watched your face. Dude, I watched man. your face. It's Listen, it's not always easy to watch yourself. Yeah. Um, but I know what a moment like that has done for all those guys that were sitting in that parking lot that day with you. That right there is what we need more of in the fire service. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate you, man. This was a lot of fun. I'm glad we finally got to do this. Hey, and man. Uh, thank you for trusting me with a little bit of your story today. And uh, as I tell every guest, you got an open invitation, man. Anytime you want to come back on, you got an open invite. Yes, sir. Thanks, you, Jeremy. I appreciate that, man. I value our relationship, our friendship, our brotherhood, man. I hope it grows, man. It's, it's and I hope just starting. There, man. We're just, just scratching the tip of the iceberg, my bud. So, thank you. Stay right where you are. I'm going to sign off the show. I'll come right back to you, so don't go anywhere, okay? All right, brother. Guys, thanks for tuning in for another episode of the National Fire Radio Podcast. What a rock star. Raymond Dorval crushed it today. I'm telling you, I'm the luckiest guy in the fire service. I'm making new friends every single day, and these guys become true brothers. And I challenge you all to do the same. Get out and enjoy the conversation. Go and get out of your zip code. Find somebody new. Find a new topic that you want to dive into. Find some people that can excite you and inspire you because that is how you push yourself personally and professionally. And lastly, do what I always do or what I always tell you to do at the end of the podcast. Take this conversation, take it back to the firehouse and talk about it because when we're talking about the job, we're making the job better. We'll see you at the next one. Thanks for tuning in. Jeremy, National Fire Radio. Fire Radio.